the members of the ICM. My name is Maria Ust and I will be your moderator here today. Welcome to the Wednesday keynote on climate justice in Sakti. After the keynote, there will be a short conversation between me and today's guest of honor, and there will also be a possibility to ask some questions. So be aware. It is, ladies and gentlemen, such a great honor to introduce today's speaker. Aile Geskitalo is the former president of the Sami parliament of Norway. She was the president for three terms and for the pr predominant uh, part of my grown-up life, actually. So I'm a little bit starstruck today. Uh, looking so much forward to hearing you, Aile. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Bori Edith, good morning. Bori Holomot, ladies and gentlemen. I bring greetings from Sami, the ancestral homeland of the Sami indigenous people. And uh, as I stand here today, I am reminded of this beautiful day in April. Capture on this photo taken on the plains of Finnmark, Finnmark, or as we say, Dwotar. Some might refer to it, it as Tundra. And did you know that the word Tundra actually is derived from the Kildin Sami language, describing the treeless mountain plains of the Arctic? It is a somewhat disconcerting thought that climate change is causing trees to grow where they should not. Will there be trees covering our dwotar, tundra, one day? Perhaps the only memory of dwotar will be the word itself. And my daughter's daughters may not even remember what a dwotar should be like. Our indigenous knowledge is entrenched in the Sami language, our collective memory. What will we do if the world we know changes? Will our knowledge collected through generations of experiences still guide us to the future. Sápmi, the Sámi homelands, are located in the northern part of Europe, encompassing Fennoscandia and the Kola Peninsula. In Sápmi, we have cultural, cultural heritage sites that document more than 10,000 years of continuous habitation. And about two to three thousand years ago, the first traces of our distinct culture began to emerge, seen through ornaments and through burial sites. We did not come from any other place. Sapmi is the cradle of Sami culture and people, as described by our great national poet and artist, Ailoas, Nils Aslak Valkyopä. He eloquently portrayed Sápmi both as a hard and cold rock cradle and a warm and soft embrace. And the yoik, where he used these words, was chosen as our national yoik during the last joint Sami conference in August. We are the people of Sápmi, but the states have drawn borders through our homelands and altered them many times. They have forcibly relocated us, 
attempted to erase our languages and culture, stolen our sacred objects, ridiculed and persecuted our leaders. And in some ways, they continue to assimilate us by encroaching upon our land bit by bit. The road des Dalot, the iron trolls, are drawing near, as the Sami rap artist Ailo Valle says in his song. It's pushing our way of life closer to a total collapse into the abyss. This forced shrinking of Sapmi has been happening for centuries. However, in recent years, we have faced a new challenge in addition to assimilation policies, arbitrary borders, and the so-called modernization. It is a known fact that the Arctic climate is changing at a faster rate than in other parts of the world. And climate change is not occurring in isolation. It brings along with it a companion called climate mitigation. It is a harsh irony that climate change wrecks havoc on the sensitive ecosystems of Satmi, while simultaneously making it more accessible for various forms of industrial development. And this irony is further heightened by climate mitigation efforts encroaching upon what remains of our land, such as renewable energy production and critical mineral extraction. I refer to this as green colonialism. We are familiar with colonialism. We have witnessed it before, and we share this experience with many other indigenous peoples. It is when our land and resources are stolen and exploited without our consent, with the profits, profits being exported. The only difference from historical colonialism is that this new form of colonialism is adorned in green, supposedly benefiting the climate and the environment. However, it is devouring our land, the foundation of our culture, consuming the last remnants of what some, might, some may call wilderness, but is, in fact, our home. My heart mourns when I see the artificial lake of the hydroelectric dam that now covers my great-grandmother's summer campsite. And it cries when I witness the pulse, the balsat, a traditional resting place where we used to gather for coffee breaks while picking cloudberries. When I see it collapsing into mud due to thawing permafrost. During summers, I ponder the presence of unfamiliar insects that I have never seen before. And what has become of the fish in the fjord where our cabin is located? They have vanished. It creates an unsettling feeling, akin with walking cautiously on thawing ice in the spring, listening with your entire body for the sound of cracking. But enough about me and our people. Some might argue that our situation is not unique. We are all experiencing climate change, and we all have a responsibility to contribute to the solutions. To that, I would like to share the words of Pakistani poet Yusra Amjad. It was not said to me that when the world burns, it doesn't always cook evenly. 
Somebody always pay a higher price. The climate crisis is a human rights crisis. And who are the most vulnerable? Refugees, women, children, disabled people, and indigenous peoples. This is unjust. This is not climate justice. The ones paying the highest price are those who have contributed the least to the problem. Yet, they are the same people expected to pay again, this time with false mitigation solutions. The double burden of climate change weighs heavily upon us. It's being paid in Papua, in Indonesia, where climate funds uh, support forestry projects that destroys the food systems of indigenous peoples. In the Amazon, where soy production for animal feed and mining drives deforestation. And in Sapmi, where the largest wind power plant in Northern Europe is destroying the winter grazing lands of my friend Maya and her family. This is climate mitigation gone wrong, creating new problems while attempting to solve ongoing ones. Fortunately, indigenous peoples and minorities are protected by human rights and national legislation. Perhaps not effectively in Indonesia or the Amazon, but certainly in the Nordic countries. Or are we? In October 11th of 2021, the Supreme Court of Norway declared two out of six wind farms on the Fosen Peninsula illegal, breaching with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, specifically Article 27. This convention is one of the core UN human rights conventions and Article 27 protects minorities' rights to enjoy their culture. Therefore, the Supreme Court of Norway ruled that the license granted to the company Fosenvin by the authorities was not legitimate and did not grant the company access to the winter grazing lands of the Sami reindeer herding community of Fosenjark. And this photo is from the start of the construction work on Fosen. And this moment could have been a truly joyous ending for the six Sami families in Fosen. Just imagine triumphing over a large state-owned energy company, Statkraft, and several major European investors from Switzerland and Germany. Imagine the highest court in Norway affirming that you were right after two decades of defending your grazing lands in and out of court. And I vividly remember listening to the court's ruling being read and conveying it to my friend and former colleague Maya through Snapchat because she couldn't get the live stream to work. I could hardly believe it. It seemed too good to be true. They had won against the state of Norway and big energy. You won, I wrote. I think you won. And then she called me and we cried together. But as I'm no, not a legal scholar, we had to double check <laughs> to ensure that I understood it, stood it correctly. But of course, there was one major problem. Norway had already permitted the construction of these illegal wind farms. 151 colossal wind turbines were already casting shadows and clusters of ice and causing disruptions in the grazing lands of Maya's reindeers. And they continue to do so. 
More than 600 days after the Supreme Court ruling, nothing has changed. Access to the winter grazing lands remains blocked for the Sami families and their reindeer herds. The government of Norway drags its feet, blaming the ruling for its supposed lack of clarity. The company Fosen Vin points, points to the government's illegal license, and the German and Swiss investors are reassured that there will be new consultations with the Sami families, and then everything will supposedly be fine. 611 days, broken promises and lack of political will. Young Sami human rights defenders have staged protests marking day 500 and day 600 with support from young envi environmentalists. There have been debates, petitions, calls for action and declarations of support. For a week in February, protesters closed the entrances to several ministries in Norway, shouting slogans like GSV and Bai Vari de Orut, perhaps even reaching here to Aarhus. Artistic events and protests have also taken place. And finally, halfway through my keynote, I come to my main message, how art can be and indeed is a part of resistance, reflection, healing and even comical relief. Allow me to explain how I perceive the role of artistic expression fulfilling these functions through examples of Sami artists in recent years. This is the Pile of Sami Supreme by Mara Hannesara. And this artwork consists of 400 reindeer skulls, cleaned and assembled together like a monumental hanging tapestry, like a carpet or a flag. The two different shades of the skull form a pattern that references to the Sami flag. Mara Hanesara created this work in protest against Norwegian reindeer husbandry and land policy in Sápmi. Against the robbery and devastation of our territories and the forced slaughter of our reindeer, as the artist herself says. Like many others, she believes that a new colonization is taking place with fatal consequences for Sámi culture. Sara has worked with this installation while her younger brother, Jovse Hante Sara, has been a, in a legal battle against the state to protect their reindeer and their family's rights against forced culling of their reindeer herd. She displayed the artwork of reindeer skulls outside the district court in Tana, outside the courts of appeal in Tromsø, and outside the parliament building when the case went to Norwegian Supreme Court. And the artwork gained significant attention when it was exhibited at the International Art Exhibition, Documenta, in Germany in 2017. Pile of Satni Supreme is about a refined, almost unrecognizable colonization in the shadow of, of modern democracy and an apparently fair legal system, says Sara. And at the same time, the artwork is about the right to practice one's culture, the right to protect the land, animals, people, and the rights in Sápmi. The title refers to Pile of Bones, the slaughter of buffalo herds in North America, carried out by white colonialists as a political strategy to destroy food systems, displace indigenous peoples from their areas, and gain access to their land. And this is what the artist herself and the National Museum of Norway, where the installation is prominently exhibited in the entrance hall, what they say about the art piece. I would like to share with you 
my own small reflections. What a cultural insider might pick up when viewing the installation. I offer you a close-up of the installation. You might find it unpleasant to see uh, the holes in the reindeer skulls, seemingly like bullet holes from a point-blank shot. Uh, the holes are, in fact, the trace of a slaughtering bolt used in the uh, industrialized slaughtering process. To me, this represents a harsh contrast to the traditional slaughtering process and how we would take care of the reindeers and the meat, the blood, the intestines, the bones, the sinews, the hides and the antlers. Our traditional food system is not necessarily accepted by authorities. And this keeps us from utilizing all that the reindeer can give us. We lose important and culturally significant sources of nutrition. The blood of the reindeer, an ingredient for traditional delicacies, is being poured into the gutter in this industrialized slaughtering process. Sara also, through this installation and the other of her art pieces, manages to encompass core Sami values in her work. She uses the reindeer skulls, which are scraps and leftovers after the hide of them has been harvested for footwork after the meat, eyes, tongues, traditionally even the brain, on them have been eaten. In Sami tradition, frugal use of resources is a core value. Nothing should go to waste, and you should never take more than you need. The traditional Sami way of life is a way of careful resource management and circular economy. It is one of the great paradoxes of modernity that I struggle with getting a grasp on. We are supposed to move towards a more sustainable society, but on our way there, we destroy what is already sustainable. We are striving for circularity, but we insist on breaking the circuit that is already circulating. I cannot understand it, I cannot accept it, but Mara Hanesara and her work helps me reflect on it. This is a photo of uh, the theater piece Etnemaddo by Siri Brock Johansen. And in Etnemaddo, which is a performance that addresses sexual abuse that the legal system fails to punish. The playwright Siri Brock Johansen has constructed a ward, the title itself, Antnemaddo, that ca ca carries strong connotations to well-known mythological figures. In Sami mythology, mythology, every animal has a maddo, a matriarch. And if you harm a small animal, the matriarch of that animal will seek gruesome revenge. And Etnemaddo is the ma matriarch of all mothers. She seeks revenge <coughs> on behalf of all daughters and sons who have been mistreated. Violence and abuse are human rights breaches and global public health issues. And particularly high rates of these exist in indigenous communities, such as Sami communities. And these have serious negative consequences for Sami communities as a whole, and for individuals, somatic and mental health. This includes sexual violence. In Norway, the police dismiss over eight out of 10 
rape reports. And one of three rape cases result in acquittal in court. The high number of dismissals at every stage of the legal process is alarming. And we also know that a significant number of rapes go unreported. This is a grave problem for those experiencing sexual violence, but it also touches on their family and friends, and also the supposed perpetrators closest ones. How are the small rural communities where many Sami lives supposed to handle the violence and the aftermath that the court system is supposed to bring to justice? Brock Johansson's theater piece brought me some solace. Perhaps this pain and trauma can be processed through art. Maybe artistic expressions can help us understand and provide us with peace where the police and the judicial system fail. The art shows the way to some kind of addressing the pain, the lack of closure towards some kind of healing. It is not perfect, but it is something. These were examples on how art becomes a powerful tool of communication of resistance, of raising awareness. Artistic, artistic expressions can touch hearts and minds in ways that words alone often cannot. As I have advocated for indigenous rights and climate justice in petitions and in political meetings, I have realized that artistic expressions have the potential to reach people on a deeper level creating empathy, creating understanding. Through art, we can convey the urgency of the issues we face, challenge the status quo and inspire change. I'm happy to see that the conference program reflects on this today. And I hope that this keynote can be a source for further reflection and for discussion. In conclusion, Cultural expressions can play a vital role in the fight for climate justice and the protection of indigenous rights. It can see, see serve as a medium for resistance, reflection, healing, and even comical relief. And to me, this represents a huge, almost untapped, and definitely renewable source of inspiration. I just hope that this source will be free-flowing now before climate change and nature loss makes irreversible harm to the world that we depend on. By supporting and amplifying the voices of all artists, and especially the voices of the most vulnerable, we can continue to shed light on the injustices faced by indigenous peoples and advocate for a more just and sustainable future. Kito. Thank you. <laughs> Please sit, Eile. Thank you so much for that powerful and important keynote. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to acknowledge two things. First of all, since we're in this International Arts Conference, I just wanted to acknowledge it's very rare that an indigenous moderator interviews an indigenous leader on stage. <laughs> <laughs> It was on time, good people, on time. <laughs> and the other thing we have to acknowledge, as you uh, have shown us and talked about, is the fact that there is, it's 611 days since the Fusen verdict. And we just need to make everyone aware also internationally about this fact that for 611 days there has been a state-run, state-driven violation to human rights in Fusen. So, um, 
I think we have to start by going back to some kind of, of core of this big question. And, um, and I want to, uh, I want to uh, go back to some fundamental premises for understanding the indigenous cultures um, of the North and our battle for land rights. Can you try to explain to us the legal framework internationally for the, the indigenous uh, rights? Well, I can try at least. Uh, uh, indigenous, indigenous individuals have uh, indi individual human rights like every other citizen of the world. Uh, but uh, uh, also minorities' rights are protected by uh, the core UN human rights conventions. And in fact, uh, Norway's, Norway was, uh, was uh, in breach of one of the uh, core UN uh, conventions in the, as the Fusen verdict mm -hmm. uh, says. Uh, indigenous peoples are often uh, uh, minorities, uh, but uh, what kind of separates national minorities from indigenous peoples is the relationships to, to our lands, mm. uh, that we are uh, connected to a specific traditional territory mm. that we continue to uh, inhabit and, and, uh, and that, uh, where we drew our draw our resources. Mm. And that connection is uh, protect protected in uh, some international conventions. Uh, the ILO Convention 169, with which is ratified of, of both mm. Norway and, and, in fact, Denmark, uh, protects uh, uh, indigenous land use uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, and we have a, an international de declaration, the UN uh, Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights, the UN DRIP, it's called in, uh, in short, and uh, that is a declaration uh, that is uh, agreed upon both uh, by the UN member states and also uh, representatives of, uh, of indigenous people. So that's a also a core document reflecting what is uh, international customary law. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and the UN Declaration on, on Indigenous Rights, you said it's uh, ratified by most uh, uh, member countries, but not all, right? There has been some debate about that. <laughs> well, uh, I, <coughs> I would like to say that it's a declaration and not a convention. Mm. Uh, so it's a declaration of political will. Mm. Mm. And most of the UN uh, member states have, uh, have supported it. Mm. Uh, some uh, most of them already when it was decided on, and, and some of the states later on. So it's broadly supported by, by UN mm. member states today. Mm. And it uh, reflects what, is sh what should be a minimum uh, support and protection mm. of uh, indigenous rights in, in uh, the distinct member states. And just tell us also just a little bit more about the ILO 169, because in Norway we refer to that a lot when we talk about the indigenous rights. Well, well uh, Norway is quite proud of uh, this international convention because Norway and the Nordic states uh, uh, had a central role in, in, in negotiating it. And Norway was, in fact, the first state to, to ratify it. So we are quite prou proud of it. Mm. And it uh, says, among others, that... Uh, the state is obligated uh, to identify indigenous lands. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry to say this is still uh, more, than, uh, more than 30 years after the ratification. It's still an ongoing and, and very polarized process in Norway. Mm. And uh, we I kind of have to ask, when we have this international legal framework, we have the ILO 169 that, as you say, Norway ratified first. And also in, in Norway, again, uh, the Sami rights, in a way, is also part of the constitution. Um, at least it says that the state is obligated to support the development of Sami culture, society, and, and language. So why is it so hard? 
when it comes to uh, real life decisions and, uh, and policy making in Norway, why do they continue to violate our rights when the legal framework is so clear? <laughs> well, uh, it's a good question. I wish I know, knew the answer. Maybe I could fix it. But, uh, but I think even if, if Sami language rights and cultural rights have had a very positive development for the last 30 years, uh, uh, what is dragging behind is the hardcore land rights and resource rights. And this might, might be because, uh, uh, because uh, so much of, uh, of the mineral uh, uh, values, the, the, the so much of the resources in, in Norway is in fact located on, outside of, on or under <laughs> Sápmi, uh, the traditional Sámi areas. Mm. So, so uh, I think there's a, an underlying fear of giving the Sámi people too much to say about how the land is going to be used uh, and the resources mm. is going to be used. Mm. So it must be something there. It's too, it's too valuable mm. to leave to the Sámi. Mm. And you mentioned also in your keynote the, the kind of t the term or the notion of green colonialism. Um, there is Fusen going on in Norway now, which is um, a very important battle for us. Uh, how do you see green colonialism kind of play its way um, in the Nordic countries uh, today? Well, it's, it's kind of... Um, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes laugh when I see the rhetoric uh, regarding industrial development today because would you believe it? Every new industrial project is a green project. <laughs> uh, it's uh, just not uh, believable. <laughs> so everything, uh, every uh, rock that we blow up or, or every fjord that we pollute, it's, it's uh, really green, uh, green uh, projects. It's, it's amazing. Uh, mm, yeah. <laughs> the future will be amazing according, according to this rhetoric. So, so, so I, I, I find it, uh, find it uh, very, very hard to, to, to deal with because, because it's, it's the same experience as always. It's nothing new. We are just doing it with uh, green clothes on. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that kind of exploitation of land is why we have troubles with the climate crisis today. Mm. So we are just continuing on the same par path, and I don't believe it will be sustainable. Uh, and and uh, but but it creates kind of um, uh, an apathy, uh, and uh, and it I think it kind of kind of uh, hinders us to engage forcefully in the climate movement mm -hmm. because of this this green colonialism. Uh, it, it kind of hinders us to, to take the place we should take in the movement for, for a better future. Mm. And speaking of which, mm, how could it have been, you know, w tell us a little bit more about the Sami culture, our, um, our um, uh, traditions, our knowledge and, and know-how, how could that have been used? How could that have played a role in a real, a true and non-false green shift? Well, well, let let me start with with um, saying that from from the peoples of Europe, <laughs> uh, the the cultures in the Arctic has often been uh, considered uh, uh, primitive, yes. uh, and uh, and uh, and to that I would say that <laughs> there is no way you could survive in the Arctic with a primitive culture. <laughs> mm. Uh, to be, <laughs> to survive <laughs> through the Arctic winter, you have to have quite a sophisticated uh, and innovative culture, mm -hmm. advanced culture, mm -hmm. because it's so, <laughs> uh, the conditions uh, can be so harsh mm -hmm. and the winter can be so long. So, so uh, you, have, you have to have technology and innovation mm -hmm. and uh, adaptation uh, abilities mm -hmm. to, to only to be. And also to thrive th with the 
cultural expressions like the Arctic uh, indigenous cultures have, uh, you have to be really advanced. So I'm quite proud of <laughs> what we have contributed to, with uh, to the world. And I think uh, especially the adaptation skills, mm -hmm. uh, they are really handy, <laughs> really handy uh, in, in a world uh, that is changing mm -hmm. so fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is one skill that uh, I think I think might be of assistance to us and maybe to others when, when uh, we are facing the climate change. Mm -hmm. My worry is that the climate change is too fast for our cultures to adapt to it. Mm. That is my single worry. Mm. Mm. And uh, tell us a little bit about the Sami concept of birget. Birget, mm. it's such a beautiful word. It is. And it carries with it so much information about uh, Sami core values. Mm. It means uh, to get by. Mm. Mm. And that is what we strive for. Uh, we don't strive for getting rich. <laughs> We strive to get by uh, uh, because you should always save some resources for your children or your grandchildren if they are not renewable or for your grandmother or your neighbor or, or uh, uh, somebody passing by that needs them. Always some leave something back so others can, can, can also be mm -hmm. uh, And this is it's a value of, of careful resource management mm -hmm. and a value of, uh, of, of, of uh, not, you know, overeating, not overusing, not, not exploiting. Mm -hmm. and, and this core value, Birgit, it has uh, helped us, I believe, uh, survive in, in quite harsh conditions, always being careful, always thinking twice, always using what you have and using everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and now with, uh, with our artwork, we even use what we didn't use before, <laughs> like the reindeer skulls. <laughs> mm. and, and how could this, these kind of elements um, from Birgit and, and from our traditional knowledge, how could that be put into tools that could be used internationally for actually um, managing a green shift? Well, well, I think uh, uh, the most important that we have to have to contribute with is uh, the view of world, uh, the circularity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the carefulness, uh, and you probably know already that uh, there is research that uh, uh, that demonstrates that uh, areas where indigenous peoples are in control that are managed by uh, indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. those are the areas with, uh, that are most protected, mm -hmm. best protected mm -hmm. from outside encroachment, where the biological uh, diversity is, is, is the biggest. Mm -hmm. And that is amazing. It tells me that we know something about how to manage lands and manage ecosystems and manage food systems, but it's so frustrating that uh, the Western world kind of tells us that, uh, okay, they are going to invent circularity and care for resource management. And to do that, they have to take our lands and resources and, and de even destroy everything uh, to, to achieve what already is there. Uh, so I hope in some kind of way that Artistic expressions can can help in explaining what we already have. It doesn't have to be invented. It is there uh, already, and it might it might need some tweaking <laughs> in a modern world, uh, probably. <laughs> uh, but but we have something valuable, and we have something to offer. Mm, the knowledge is there. Um, how do you see the art world? We're now in this in this big uh, international performing arts conference, uh, and with the international performing arts scene present, uh, how do you see the arts field's role, uh, both in Sathmir but also internationally? What role can we play uh, in in bringing um, justice uh, into the green shift and to address these important questions? Well. Um 
I've been a political leader. I'm currently a um, human rights expert working in Amnesty Norway. And uh, I, I have tried <laughs> through those careers to, to explain to uh, Norwegian and international decision, decision makers uh, how, how things should be. Uh, not always so su successful. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, the art world could, um, could be a kind of uh, an additional platform, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, something to, 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 uh, to make us more visible, uh, to, to make us be better understood, uh, to capture the eye, to, to force uh, leaders to listen. Uh, to force experts to, to consider uh, our uh, arguments, our, 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 uh, what we would like to contribute with. Because I think indigenous peoples could contribute more even to, to climate activism. Uh, but I think we, we kind of, we are kind of, um, well, uh, we're supposed to be in the front line, but, but, but we are kind of, kind of, sidelined because uh, uh, because <laughs> there's um, something something is lost in translation mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe and maybe the art world could could help with that kind of translation mm -hmm. uh, to force uh, to 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 offer reflections and offer insight and new perspectives mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic op about what the art world could mm. contribute with. Uh, I am too, and the Sami uh, art world is thriving, and, uh, and uh, our artists are doing a fantastic job, both uh, nationally and internationally. But I uh, also wanted you to reflect on, in this, um, uh, in this room, there's the international performing arts uh, professionals of different kinds, and I think also, um, been listening to the conversations for the last few days here at conference, I think many want to uh, help, to, to play a role, uh, but many will also be reluctant to kind of step into that discourse because uh, one is afraid to kind of ap appropriate the, um, uh, the, uh, the discourse and take it away from those who, are who owns it, which is the, the indigenous peoples. So I think for many in the international art, wor art world, it can sometimes feel uh, difficult to find their space um, and, and place in, in such a, also an artistic discourse. Um, do you have any reflections on how one can be a good ally? Mm, I, I understand that kind of hesitancy. You might not want to step, do the wrong things or, or stepping, on, stepping on someone's toe. So, so I understand that this, uh, uh, this can be uh, a bit of uh, sensitive, uh, but, but I think, uh, there are possibilities both to make space for indigenous arts and uh, indigenous uh, artists and to elevate uh, their voices. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think also uh, both smaller and bigger uh, institutions, both on the national level, regional level, can create those spaces and, and give voices to, to indigenous peoples through their arts. Mm. And I think this conference is a good example. Mm -hmm. You already commented on mm -hmm. that in fact we are two indigenous Sami women having a conversation uh, uh, on, the, on, on a big stage in this conference. Mm. Uh, I think that's a, a good way of doing it. Mm. <laughs> sure. That's sure. That would be interesting both to indigenous peoples and to, to hopefully also to 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 others, uh, uh, so so there are good examples to learn from. There are, and let me also just add when we have the opportunity: never, never about us without us. Collaboration, co cooperation is 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 very very important, and I think I think uh, uh, also also Sami artists are bolder 
about about entering uh, that kind of collaboration now because uh, because we have seen good examples mm. of, of how, how that could work. Absolutely. Uh, <coughs> am I supposed to keep track of time? <laughs> okay. I see we have five minutes left. And uh, good people, uh, you can prepare your questions. We will have some questions from the floor if there's anything you'd like to ask. And we have one question over there, and you will have a microphone in a second. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm down here. Um, thank you very much for your keynote and uh, to the programming for you being here, both of you. Thanks for that. Um, I have something which is maybe more a, a, a request for a, a pondering from maybe both of you. Um, as far as I know, the work of Sara started by those 40 reindeer beheaded of her brother's uh, uh, herd being placed in a neat pile, mm -hmm. bloody, full, headed um, outside various uh, institutions. Um, and of course, there's a limit to how many pictures you can have and how deep you can go in the story. And I'm just curious if you do not show us that first part of her process with the killing, with the, with the slaughtering, because you want to protect us a bit, because <laughs> these, these uh, people here don't see blood and dead mm -hmm. animals so often, or if it's, uh, <laughs> it's only for time, or just this whole um, gray zone of her working as an activist. Here's 40 beheaded reindeer in front of whatever big institution in Norway it was, or it was probably several places, and they got nice and smelly along the way. And then this, the art institution acknowledged it as an art piece, because it's now been more worked on and it's in a in a condition where we can have it indoor uh, there's just something interesting about that i would like you to talk a bit about well if i may uh, well it was first and foremost um, uh, because of the time restrictions but you can all google pile of sap me mm -hmm. and you will find the whole story with photographs of of uh, the uh, the development of of the artwork but I, would l I wanted to focus on the holes in the skulls. Mm. And the last artwork, uh, I think, showed that the best. So, uh, and also, that is the artwork that, is that exists now. <laughs> uh, and it's hanging in the National Museum of, uh, of Norway in Oslo. Mm. But I can also just add a, a, a brief anecdote on, on that process, because it was a long process. They first appeared in front of the courthouse in Tana, uh, in a big pile, as you said, with, with the hairs and you know, everything on them. And just going from that to the skulls that are smell-free and you know, an art piece <laughs> hanging in the National Museum, that's been a long journey. And on the way, she has created different works as part of the Pile of Satme project. So there's been many many kind of kinds of, of um, installations on the way. And in the middle of the process here at some point, at that time I was the director of the Arctic Arts Festival in, in Norway and we had this uh, big, um, uh, big concert with our greatest uh, Sami artist and she had an installation on stage with these heads. But at this time the, the smell was not gone. It, but <laughs> there's, it's a long process with preparing them to be dry and you know ready for display. So we had this huge Sami celebration, a fantastic concert and also Anders Sunna, which is a great Sami artist, was doing uh, an art piece and she had um, this um, uh, pile of sapmi and the Norwegian crew, they protested, they were like, we would not want to work <laughs> on that stage because of the, of the smell. And it was like a fantastic paradox with this Sami, <laughs> Sami show and this extremely powerful Sami art piece that smelled so terrible. Yes. Uh, so uh, it was so like, yeah. So, so uh, the Samis were unpleasantly, <laughs> extremely unpleasantly <laughs> present. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it was and that great is night. a way of uh, of uh, taking, uh, creating a problem for them, <laughs> not only for us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was very happy. That day, really. <laughs> Thank you. Great question. We have time for one more question over there. Well, it's not uh, really a question. My name is Kira Arnberg, uh, living in Oslo. Um, I just want, you, you mentioned Birgit, and the Sami choreographer Elie Sofie Sara made a piece for the contemporary dance company Carte Blanche in, 
in Bergen, and they present actually Birgit in Oslo this week, and yes. hopefully they will tour a lot. I'm so happy you mentioned that, and I wanted to say that regarding a fantastic Sami art being made right now. The absolutely fantastic Sami choreographer Ella Sofasada created together with Yuar Nango this, uh, this performance called Birgit, which is placed in, in Oslo now, and I uh, suppose it will also have a broad international tour at some point, so you will be able to see it, and it's actually on the on the core of the topics that we yeah, talk about. Yes, yes, and I'm so sorry to have missed it so far. I'm so looking forward to to, to seeing that. And uh, uh, Ella Sofa is uh, fantastic. He, she's from my hometown, like Marahan Sara is as well. So, and it tells something about about uh, the possibilities to be to be uh, an an artist, Sami artist today. Uh, and you are Nango is currently exhibiting uh, at the Venice um, Architectural Biennale mm -hmm. in the Nordic Pavilion. And I'm hoping to see that exhibition. Are you going? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and we're looking forward to that. And uh, I think it will be kind of fair to, uh, speaking of this, uh, end this conversation with the words of Paulina Fedorov, who was also one of the artists at the Venice Biennial Sami Pavilion last year, who said, don't buy our lands, buy our art or ticket <laughs> to our shows instead. So <laughs> we'll leave. Great way. Thank you so much, Thank you.